Hi, this is Sam Collins from the American Acupuncture Council Network, and we're glad to bring you the third part with Dr. Lauren Brown. And today's focus will be on hiring administrative staff, really understanding how to make this office work, but also it's not just yourself. Who do you have with you and how do you make sure they really help to really make your office work better? So, Dr. Lauren, thank you for appearing with us again, and, and we're so happy for this. And again, just kind of give us a preview of where we're going. Sam, again, thank you very much for having me back, and uh, I'm happy to be sharing with my colleagues, my peers here online with you guys. So um, we've had a, couple, a series of lectures, and today we were going to talk about hiring and mid staff and associates. And this is really important because, you know, to grow, you need other people, really. And I mean, that's not just hiring and mid and associate mentors, life. That's just nobody becomes a, a successful individual, right? People who are successful are successful because of the people that surround them. And in this case, um, when you're running a practice, um, having admin staff, and for those that um, also want to really expand and grow, adding associates to your practice is an important way to grow. And like anything in business, because you are in business, we talked about this earlier, you are a small business, whether you like it or not. So in business, um, you do need to hire the right people in order to get to where you want to go. So that's what we're going to kind of talk about, the pros and cons and the pitfalls. And, uh, you know, the most important thing, learning from my mistakes. I made a ton of them. And so I made them for you. So I'll share you all the things I've screwed up from when I started in 2000. So you don't have to go through the extra effort and the pain and misery that I did to learn my lessons on uh, hiring and men, staff and associates. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Well, no, that's great. That sounds really good. In fact, I think that's often where people don't pick up on. Definitely look at where someone's been successful or not successful and, and follow those. And I think that's really what you're going to give us today. It's kind of what you've, you've run into and what works well. So uh, let's continue because I think you have a PowerPoint presentation you're going to show us as well. I do. Let's bring it up and we're ready to go. All right. So hiring men, staff and associates. Um, and again, I, I get to wear two hats. I'm quite fortunate um, for those that are new to me. Um, I am a doctor of Chinese medicine. I practice in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. It's called AccuBalance Wellness Center. And at the time of this recording, I have eight associates and I have uh, three full-time admin people for my AccuBalance clinic. I also run um, healthy seminars. Some of you may know it as pretty seminars and Medagogy. Um, and there I have uh, four full-time um, staff in there as well. And I also am the chair of the Integrated Fertility Symposium. Um, all three are very successful because of the people that I have surrounded myself with. So I'm going to share those secrets with you now, and hopefully uh, you, can, you can do the same. So to build a busy practice, to be successful, um, to do what you love, to be in service for other people, um, you want to have patience. It's really important. You know, you could be the best doctor in the world, really, ta really talented, but if you're not able to um, attract patients into your practice and maintain um, patients, then it's hard to do the healing, right? You don't see as many people. So if you want to heal as many people as possible, um, you want to build a busy practice, and that requires referrals. So referrals, getting new patients, but also referrals as in patients coming back to you. So also having these patients that have seen you in the past to want to continue to see you in the future. And referrals come from having informed admin staff, from creating informed patients, and from being an informed TCM practitioner yourself. What I'm gonna focus on right now is having informed admin staff. In our short time together, I'm not gonna go into creating informed patients or being informed TCM practitioner. We touched a bit on that on my other two lectures here um, with you guys, but today we're gonna to focus on having informed admin staff. So your front staff is so incredibly valuable, and it's quite obvious, but it's worth repeating or sharing these. So they're your first contact for patients. Before I ever see a patient in my practice, they have to call or email or talk to somebody in my front staff. Um, if they book online, they still get greeted by my front staff. So they are so important to your practice and often they are dismissed or ignored or the value is not put to them. And I will share with you in my own experience, um, I've been in practice since 2000, have a busy practice. And there have been times where um, I, uh, patient coordinator, that's what we call our, our front end, our patient coordinators have left for moving to other countries, um, moving on or having babies and going on maternity leave. And we have seen our practice go from super busy to shrink fairly quickly. And the doctors were the same. Our website is the same. What we're doing is the same. You know what changed was the front staff. 
And I've been in practice at the time of this recording, again, I said since the year 2000. And so the first time I didn't really get it, I thought something was going on in the environment, what's going on. But as I would see when we had change in the front, I could see how my front, my, my patient volume would either grow or shrink based on who was working my front. So I hope I've made enough emphasis that this is a very important person in your practice. They need to instill confidence in your patients. Um, you want them to be really knowledgeable. So we train our admin staff, our patient coordinators, to be like doctors that can't legally treat. So um, they actually will take some of the healthy seminars, those courses on protein metagogy that we have on healthyseminars.com, they are required to take those courses. They're required to read certain books so they understand what we do so they can communicate it to the patients. Now, we will give them some verbiage, you know, to, you know, when patients ask, we do a lot of reproductive health fertility. So how does acupuncture help with fertility? They have three to five points that they could give to the patients. But memorization is a lower form. We want them to really understand and have it as part of their being. So we treat our patient coordinator so they can experience the medicine. And we also get them to become like doctors that can't legally treat. So they really understand it so they can have a good communication with our patients. Um, I encourage um, you guys, we do, we treat our staff and their family members. So they will get um, a super deal free sometimes to a super, super discount for the family members because we want them to be advocates of our medicine and therefore we encourage them to get treated themselves, the patient coordinators and their family members. One thing I learned really early on, I shouldn't say it took me a couple of years, so I, I'm not the sharpest guy, I guess. Um, a really important question when interviewing your patient coordinators, your receptionists, is to ask them if they've ever had acupuncture before. Um, I've had more than once, it took me twice to figure this out, I've hired somebody who had a fear of needles. So how do you think that worked for my front end when patients would call wanting acupuncture? You know, they just couldn't be genuine, they couldn't be inspired, they couldn't be excited, they couldn't be honest to say you should come in for it because the thought of somebody getting acupuncture made them nauseous. So it is one of the questions in my interview process is, um, have you ever had acupuncture before? And I listened to see whether yes or no, and what's the reaction? Did they seem excited about it or hesitant about it? And it's one of the ways I weed out, we have a funnel system, which we're gonna go over. I weed out um, the interview interviewees is if they don't seem interested or excited about acupuncture, um, since that's a huge modality we use in our practice, then they can't work our front. They, can't, they won't get hired. They're not the right fit, which is let's talk about um, hiring for the right cultural fit. This is a really important topic. Um, again, it took me a long time to realize this. So let's go into what is and what isn't the right fit and how having the right fit in your practice, the associates you hire and the admin staff that you hire, your patient coordinators, if they're happy, if they fit well, then your patients will be happy. They always say happy employees, happy customers. So for us, your employees, your customers, I should say, I'm going to say that differently, you, if you own the clinic and you have admin staff and you have associates, your customers are your employees, not just your patients. So I realize I have eight associates and I have three full-time admin staff at my clinic. So my, my customers are really my employees in my clinic because if they're happy, they're going to make sure my patients are happy. So some of the pitfalls that you need to know, and it took me about 11 years. Um, in 2011, the light bulb went off for me when I realized I was, I was not hiring properly. Originally, I would just hire somebody um, that was in the pay scale that I wanted, and they had the skill set. I didn't hire for fit. And it was quite a toxic environment at times. Sometimes the, uh, the person working our front uh, made my doctors miserable or me miserable, and therefore our, our patients were miserable. So it's not just um, the pay structure and the skills, they have to fit well. So um, I've often hired nice people. They just seem like pleasant. They're going to be really caring and empathetic to my patients, but they couldn't, they didn't have the skill set. We, um, I remember one um, patient coordinator we, we were interviewing and we were quite serious about it and, and gave her a good month to try. She was um, mature and um, she just wasn't really good with the computer. Like just using the mouse was a challenge for her. It took forever, right? And so we realized that wasn't the right skill set for us. We need somebody that's quite computer savvy, 
But again, we, she was so nice. That's why we tried to hire her, wanted to hire her. Now I just know she doesn't have the skill set. She couldn't work for us. You want to be clear about the job and the role. Um, it's just really important. You got to be able to delegate to your staff. So you, you want to do the things in your practice that you are excellent at, that almost nobody else can do as well as you. And you want to delegate to other people that that's what they do great at. You don't want to delegate to your staff that things you don't like and, they not, and they're not good at. That's not going to build a successful practice. You want to delegate to people where they shine, where they're great. And I'll give you a really interesting example here. I'm a CPA, right? A certified professional accountant. I'm really good at doing accounting and bookkeeping but I actually hire a bookkeeper. And I actually would go out and say that I probably can do accounting better than the bookkeeper I have hired. But I'm an excellent practitioner and I run IF Symposium and Healthy Seminars and my hourly rate seeing patients or doing these other things is much more than the hourly rate I would pay a bookkeeper or I do pay a bookkeeper. So I've delegated the bookkeeping to somebody that's great at bookkeeping even though I'm good at it as well, because there's other things that I do that other people cannot do. And so I make sure I stay in my area of excellence, which allows my clinic to thrive and all the other things, the Integrated Fertility Symposium, Healthy Seminars to thrive as well. So hiring for cultural fit. Um, you really got to know um, who, what, your, what your culture is. So who are you? What's your clinic um, based on? What's your culture fit? So I'm going to share with you um, the AccuBounce culture fit. Um, you can borrow some of these if they resonate for you, but you got to really find out what it is for you that's going to be the fit for you. Um, and in the interview process that we have created at AccuBounce, it's, it's a little bit tedious as in there's several touch points, which I'm going to go into more detail. Um, but we've done this because what I want to do is kind of create a funnel because when you put out ads for, um, for jobs, sometimes you can get 100 plus applications. So my goal is to find one great um, candidate, right? That's really the ideal. So I need a funnel. I want to be able to weed out people. So knowing what your culture is, is a good part of it. Now, things that I need is they have to agree with the pay scale that we, we have. So that's a check mark. They have to have the skill set, so we got to assess the skill set. And then there's all these other things that's really the cultural fit because the wrong fit um, could make your clinical environment quite toxic, and the right fit can make it what I call kumbaya, just you love coming to work. Everybody's getting along well, and it really impacts your practice and your patient's experience as well. So we have several touch points, which I'm going to go over, and I'll, I'll say a couple of times because people often ask for these. I share the AccuBalance hiring process, our advertising that we do, so the ad we put out to attract patient coordinators, and the interview process, the interview questions I use that we've come up with and created, and all the different steps um, and why we do it. I've, um, I put that up in a PDF for you, and that's at the bottom of the slide, and I'll say it's healthyseminars.com forward slash right fit. So if you go there, you can actually, it's not pretty, it's just for my internal use, but I've put it up there for you to, to use um, as a guide for yourself as well. So here's some of the culture fit things that are important for my team. And, and this is what we look for. Um, flexibility, self-motivated. So a good self-starter, right? You don't have to be sitting there and telling them what to do all the time. Um, supportive, right? So we're like a chain of links, right? So the weakest link can affect the whole chain. So they're, they got to support each other. They're passionate about health and, and wellness and serving others. So we want that passion. They're good with change because we're always um, pioneering and doing different things in my clinic. So if they like a lot of structure, they're not going to do well at our clinic because we're kind of a flexible, flowing organization. So they got to be able to embrace change. They, they, they work hard, but they also play hard. They can take holidays. They can have a good time. And they got that uh, working on that good balance in their life. Um, they value results over effort. So, you know, trying hard is not good enough in our clinic. Everybody, we think, puts the effort in. It, uh, results are really important in our clinic. So it's not just enough that you have the right intention. You actually have to have action behind your intention. Um, being accountable and responsible. So, you know, being able to take responsibility for what you do, whether it's didn't work out and also that it did work out. So it's not like, oh, no, don't give me praise. In our clinic, you know, hey, when you've done something well and we applaud you, um, we want you to be able to take that in and enjoy that. So, again, that balance. Friendly, interest in personal growth. We're constantly doing personal growth here and being kind and empathetic. This is what we're looking for. 
it's not easy to find this in an individual, all these things. So our interview process, as you're going to see, um, allows us to funnel this down. And again, it's available at healthyseminars.com forward slash right fit. So you want to outline the process to your, your prospects when you send this out. Um, so you want to create a clear job description and expectations. So what the job is, is and isn't. Include all the relevant stuff, the position details, the salary. All that stuff is really going to be important um, um, to land the right candidate. You want to be transparent, so we're transparent. So you can read this slide. I'm going to go into more detail now what's in this slide. The only thing I want to highlight here is um, at the end, I say, on point three here, give the candidates a specific action for them to complete to assist in resume sorting. Again, you'll get 100 plus resumes based on your ad. Um, so... I don't want to look at um, 100 resumes in detail, or I should say I don't want to interview 100 people. So we have two things we always ask for. Um, we're looking for somebody who's detail-oriented at our front. So we always say um, put the, uh, the cover letter um, attention to. Don't drop it off. You have to email it in, etc. And the reason we do this is if they go and search our website and find my name and say attention Lauren Brown because it's never my name, then we know they didn't listen to the instructions that we put out in the ad. So we sometimes um, we make up a name that's not on our website. So to really make sure they're reading, right? So we attention to detail is one thing we always ask for. Um, um, and we ask them to put that in their resume, say attention to Lorianne. The second thing is we ask for a cover letter, um, why they are an ideal fit. Because a lot of people are applying everywhere. And you know, in Chinese medicine, it's uh, individualized medicine. So we want somebody that can go the extra mile, that's going to be amazing to our patients. And therefore, I don't want a template cover letter coming to my clinic. I want to know they took a moment to look at our website, that they actually have interest at working at my clinic at AccuBalance. And so I want them to take the moment and send an individualized cover letter. Now, I know there's going to be repetition that they're sending to everywhere, but just the fact that they know a little bit about my clinic and they show a little bit of extra interest because that's what we're looking for, you know, going back here, um, flexible, self-motivated, right? I'm looking for somebody that gets stuff done. And so I don't want a templated uh, cover letter. So those are the two things we do in the, when they have to send in their resume, their CV, is we ask them for attention to so-and-so in the letter and so send us a cover letter. And if they don't come with a cover letter, shredder. If they say attention, Lauren Brown, shredder. We don't look at it. Okay, even if they look great, everything else on there could look great. It's just, it's one of our weeders. We want to funnel it down to like the best three. I don't want to interview 100 people. So let's talk about writing a great job description. So introduce your job and state what, uh, what type of person you're looking for. Basically, you want to be transparent. If you're uncomfortable putting something in the ad, like how much you're going to pay, then there's something wrong there, right? Then you're not paying enough. Okay, I would say that if you can't, if you're, you got to, you want to be transparent. So you want to be proud of what you're offering. And so you want to be able to put in your, in your job offer what you're offering. Um, so you, that's part of attracting the right person, right? That right fit is be open and honest who you are. Well, one of the values at AccuBalance is transparency. So for us, our, our ad is quite transparent. If you're, val if you don't value transparency, then your ad may be very um, cryptic. I don't know. I recommend transparency. And so this is how we do it. State the responsibilities, provide details about our salary location, and outline the interview process and how to apply. And again, we go into detail, more detail than our short lecture here on that link, healthyseminars.com forward slash right fit. Let's look at these four steps and let me show you an example of what we've done at AccuBalance. So here is our, our ad, right? Uh, let me just pull this up here. Here's our ad. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to us. Um, AccuBalance Wellness Center is British Columbia's leading wellness center for integrative reproductive care. Our commitment to patient care is unsurpassed, and we are looking to add a new team member to our front desk team. Our clinic is located on the west side of Vancouver on the Broadway Corridor. You'll be assisting in providing coordinated care for patients by administering an organized and welcoming front of clinic presence, whilst working with a supportive and close-knit team. You are a mature-minded, clear and concise communicator with a warm, empathetic, and friendly demeanor. Um, as first point of contact to the clinic, you make the most me uh, memorable impression. Then, this is still a part of the ad, what are we seeking? So then we list off all the, all the features that we want in our candidate. Again, you can read these on your own. You can pause and look at this right now. 
then we share what we're going to provide, right? And so this is, again, I'm starting to, I'm looking for the right fit. So right off the bat, we're letting them know who we are and we're letting them know what we want. I want the successful candidate. So we do give them a little bit of information to be successful. We do have things to weed out um, um, and to, to test them um, because, you know, people can play trickery with you as well in the interview process to pretend they're somebody they're not. But again, we give them the benefit of the doubt at the beginning. Um, we're sharing the anticipated start date. Um, there you can see the attention to Lorian down at the bottom right. You can see that down at the bottom. You can see um, attention to Lorianne. It's full time. And we put in the salary um, for, and it depends where you are. Some, some places where you live, um, that may be really a low salary. This is in Canadian funds. Um, and for some places where you live, this may be a lot of money. So you got to look at where you are located as well. We're in down to, uh, health in a good part of uh, Vancouver. Okay. So AccuBalance interview process. So this is um, what we do once um, we put out the ad. So this is the, proce the process that they are required to go through. They send in a cover letter and a resume. Um, we do a phone interview. Um, Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to roll back here. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. So they send in their cover letter and resumes. That gets sorted. We weed out if they don't say attention to Lorianne. We weed out if they don't have a good resume. And we don't want somebody that has to commute two hours. So if we see on the resume that they're living somewhere that's a two-hour commute, we're aware they may not um, be of interest to us. So after they, we, we sort through the resumes, we have a, a, a large number still to, that look like good candidates, hopefully and we start the phone interview process. Now, one of the values that we want is flexibility, remember, I, I put there. And so this is where we start to test our candidates early on. In the resume process, we ask for you know, attention. We wanna know if they have attention to detail and can they follow instructions. So we ask them, put attention to Lorian, and we ask them to send in a cover letter why they would be a good fit. So that helps us. And then we look at their background to see if they have skill set. We're looking for customer service. So I don't tend to hire medical office assistants, people that have worked in, in the medical office industry. Because in, in Canada, it's social medicine. And these people have a three-month wait list, and they're miserable. <laughs> so I don't want to hire them usually, right? They're overworked, and they don't need to be nice to the patients because it's free, and they, they want patients to go away. So you're lucky if you go into a, a medical office in Canada and the patient coordinator uh, medical offices actually looks up and acknowledges you. So I often look for people that have been in the hospitality industry that have a desire to learn about health. You know, So we're looking for people that have worked at spas, worked in hotels, um, service industry. We do look for that. That's what we want because we want great VIP customer service. In the phone interview, we once we get the resumes, we send out to the people we want to interview and we give them basically uh, almost like a 48 hour notice to choose a time. So they'll get, let's, if today's Monday, they'll get a, an email saying you've been selected um, for step two of the interview process. And the times that we have available are Monday afternoon, so later that day and Tuesday. Now it's a phone interview, and the phone interview states it's gonna be 10 minutes, or, or 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes is what it states for the phone interview. And I call them. 10 minutes before the scheduled time. Now, I'm still representing my clinic, so I want them to like us, and I want to set a good example for my clinic, um, but I'm calling them early because I want to see how they handle something happening that's not ordinary. What happens if a patient shows up before an appointment or a patient shows up late? How do they handle something that's just not normal, that change idea? How do they, how do they deal with that? So it, it kind of looks like this. I call them up and I go, hi, it's Dr. Lauren Brown calling from AccuBalance Wellness Center. And they go, oh, hi. And I go, and I take accountability and responsibility right away. I, I'm aware that um, our, our, our phone interview is not for another 15 minutes. I'm ahead of schedule. So I was wondering if you're okay if we start the interview now. And if you're not ready, I'm okay because I'm early. I'll call you back at the scheduled time. The reason I do this is I want to know, are they on a bus 10 minutes before our phone interview? Where are they? Like, are they ready? I don't want somebody coming into my office at their start time, running in with their jacket, all flustered and all over the place. I want them to come in early and get settled and be ready. So this is part of that right fit part of the interview process. So everything we do has purpose behind it. And so 
I want to see how they answer the phone. Are they upset that I'm calling them early? Are they flexible and accommodating? Are they able to speak their truth and say, you know what? Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm almost ready. Can, can we, can it be in five minutes? I just need another five minutes. Just wanted to see how they handle the unknown. When I call them and I, and I, and I, um, and I purposely don't do an in-person or Skype myself. Some people do Skype interviews. My patients are going to call the clinic and they're going to hear their voice. They're not going to see. So I don't want to be distracted or, or confused by the patient's appearance, uh, not my patients, the patient coordinator's appearance in the interview process at the beginning. So I close my eyes when I call, as I ask, you know, I'm early, and I listen to their voice. Do they smile? When I, have my eye, when I hear them, can I understand what they're saying? Do they speak clearly? Does it sound like they're friendly on the phone? Are they inviting? Or are they rude and I can't understand them? Do they mumble? What's going on? So that's why I do the phone interview first. And I don't do Skype because I've not always done the hiring. And I've seen places where they hire a very attractive person to work there, but they're not the right fit. So I want to make sure I'm hiring for what I want in my clinic. I'm not hiring a pretty face. I'm hiring somebody who's the right fit, who um, has skill set as well. If they get through the phone interview, we do the phone interview. We say it's about 10 minutes. You'll see the questions. Again, it's at healthyseminars.com, right fit. I have these questions I ask. Um, there's about 10 of them. In this process, I ask them, have you had acupuncture before? Um, I let them know the full process that we're going to basically, st step one is the phone interview, um, or step two, here's the phone interview. Step three, if you want to continue with the process and we want to continue with you, we'll go on to step three. I explained at the very beginning that we're looking for cultural fit and that there's several steps and that we are aware that you're interviewing us as much as, much as we're interviewing you. And therefore, we need several touch points because we can't tell if you're the right candidate, the right fit based on your resume or based on this phone call. And you can't tell whether we're the right fit for you either at this stage. So we like to have a few more touch points. And so what it would look like is after our phone call is um, if you want to continue and we want to continue, we'd have you come in for a 10 or 15 minute in-person interview. Now, in my schedule, I allow for 30 minutes, but it's 10 to 15 because we do want to be kind and we don't like to reject people, although we do actually have to reject people. We don't enjoy that process. And we don't want people to leave AccuBalance as part of the experience. Even if we don't choose you as a candidate, we don't want you to leave feeling worse about yourself. So we say it's a 10 to 15 minute interview because if we know they're not the right fit right off the bat, we don't keep them there long and we can get on with our day. So they, they, they're expecting to leave in 10 minutes. So it doesn't seem like, oh, this went really badly. If they're the right fit, we'll ask them how their time is and can we spend a few more minutes together. And I tell them for expectations what this part is, step three is it's just about you experiencing your commute because you got to get to your get to work every day. So what is the commute like? Um, and also for you to see the physical surroundings. Maybe you don't like the paint on our walls. For me, what I want to know is, can you find my clinic? Can you show up on time? And can you become dressed for success? You see, I want them to be successful. I've already shared with them what success looks like. Find my clinic, show up on time, dress for success. And sometimes they ask what that is, right? If not, I just let them figure out what that is, right? What does success, dress for success look like for, for your practice? So that's what we're looking for. And then I have more questions that I ask during that process when they're there in person. And again, that's at healthyseminars.com forward slash right fit. Then we've narrowed it down to just a few at this point. Um, and step four is they come back and it's, it's a working interview where they're going to work at the front desk, they're going to see how our scheduling works. They'll meet some of our patients, so they get to understand our demographic. Um, they get to meet more of the practitioners. They get to do the commute again. They get to see what the chair is like. And so, as you can see, our success that we've talked about in some of the other interviews is about being of service to others, being of value. I'm interviewing this person, but we're making sure they're having an incredible experience during this process because we do want it to be the right fit for them. We want them to know that this is the right place and not want to leave after three weeks or a month. And we also want to get some time to know them. So every time we have a touch point with them, it gives us an opportunity to know them better. And then step five, we're hoping we don't have any more than three people for the last step. And they come back and they'll be about four hours um, working the front and trying things out. I usually give them some material to read in between step four and step five, sometimes even between step three and step four. 
And if they don't do it, then they lose, they're out of the process. So we're seeing how badly do they want it and what are they willing to do? Can they do to get this uh, position? We really want somebody to really want to be there and we really want to have that person. So the good news and bad news is using the process that I've shared here, um, it really um, funnels down to the right fit and you find amazing staff. I mean, amazing staff they make your clinics in. The bad news is I've gone through this process where we've had over 100 resumes and we don't get anybody to step five and we have to start again. We have to start again. So we go through all this process and we don't have anybody that's the right fit for us. So the good news and bad news is you will find the right fit using this. Um, the bad news is it takes time. But again, I being in practice since 2000, I've been with the wrong fit. I can't go there again. I, I won't go there again. So this is the process that we have done. Um, some of the things that we've done wrong um, um, for hiring for right fit. So we had the nicest person. So the right fit, they got the skill set, but they didn't want to be a career running, the, you know, running your front, a patient coordinator. So I have hired a teacher that didn't have work. So she took the position and I hired a counselor. These people were awesome. Our clinic was singing. We even bored them and had them do some work in healthy seminars. They were amazing. But guess what? Soon as the job came around for the teaching position, they gave me two weeks and were gone. And I had two of them. I had a teacher and a counselor at the same time. And within two weeks of each other, one found a counseling position um, outside of the, my area and one found a teaching position. And they left. They didn't leave out of anger. They liked being here, but they never intended to be patient coordinators. They didn't go to school to do that. And so part of that right fit is if somebody has, you know, is a, a physician from another, you know, is a physician or is a researcher, um, is a CPA, <laughs> I'm not hiring them because they have no intention to be here. You know, back in 2008, when times were bad, you should see the resumes you would get from people, right? How qualified they were. Mm -hmm. So you really want to know what you're looking for. And this process works well, but it also is challenging to find that right fit. We hired somebody recently. It's the first time that somebody doesn't feel we're the right fit. She is amazing. Our clinic's been singing. She's been with us for a month, but she realized she doesn't want to be in healthcare anymore. And she just doesn't feel energized here, the space, whatever's not working for her. I think there may be even a conflict with one of the individuals in our clinic, but she was comfortable to say it's not the right fit. I'm sad that she's going because she was amazing, but she's choosing it's not the right fit. She's not going to thrive. What's interesting is the relationship is so good because of the process that we have to connect with this individual is she is sticking around to do some contract work with me on other projects I have. So it's not like she despises us and it's negative. It's just like She's aware it's not the right fit, and so she's uh, exiting from the position. So it can go both ways. You may not choose them, but they also may not choose you, okay? Um, one of the things I shared about, you know, um, I talked about hiring a teacher or, or um, a counselor, you know, somebody who wasn't really interested in this position long, long term. Kind of related to that is a lot of people say, well, I do my own reception. Do I need a receptionist? And so I just have the following questions to ask you. Did your schooling train you to treat patients or be a receptionist? Okay. I don't think any of you that are practicing Chinese medicine have been trained to be patient coordinators, medical office assistants. They trained you to be practitioners. So that's what you should be doing. Does your passion lie in treating patients or doing an in task? So my answer is no, you shouldn't be doing your own phones. And maybe Sam will have questions for me later on in that, but you know, it's just like, no, you shouldn't be, you, we went to train, you trained to be a practitioner and you should be being practitioner. You shouldn't be doing your own phones. And if you hire somebody that's great at doing phones, your practice will grow tremendously as well, because instead of billing and collecting money and doing all these things that you're, it's probably not your passion and you're not skilled at as well as somebody else is at, you could be actually be treating more patients. So now we're going to switch gears. That was for the patient coordinators. So now we're going to talk about associates. So I mentioned I have eight associates. Geez, I screwed this up really well too, guys, just to let you know. Um, I lost a friendship over this. So um, one of my earlier associates I hired back in 2004, um, we became uh, really good friends. Um, he was an amazing associate, amazing practitioner, great with patients. And I did not know how to manage or lead. I was a practitioner. I had a busy practice. And I did not have the skill set to manage or lead other individuals. I'm a self-starter, self-motivator, 
And um, I take accountability and responsibility that he left. You know, he left. He left um, after about five years being um, being in my clinic, and uh, it was a tremendous loss for me, uh, both friendship and in my practice. It took me a while to figure out again that hey, I had to take accountability and responsibility. So the first two or three associates that left my practice, um, I blame them. You know, it was it was their fault. It wasn't until I realized that I am solely responsible for my practice. I'm the founder. I'm the, the, the uh, self-appointed leader. Therefore, I'm fully responsible and accountable. And when that attitude, we talked about mindset, Sam and I, um, at the first time we chatted, when I had that shift um, and took responsibility, first, I went and took some management training, leadership training, you know, reading books. We talked about all that. And at their, our other interview, we talked about investing in yourself. So I, I really w- made a focus on developing my, my skill set at managing and leading a team. And, um, and now I have eight associates and we have, uh, we have a good time and uh, it, it's, it's changed. The energy has changed. I will share with you when you're thinking to add associates to your practice is kind of think of why you want to do this and just a little bit of a, a reality test as well here just to let you know that as soon as you hire an associate, um, you're going from being a practitioner to being a manager as well. So how much do you like to manage people and how skilled are you at managing people? I actually don't enjoy managing people. I enjoy mentoring. I love that. But I don't enjoy managing people. So in my practice, I have two full-time patient coordinators and a office manager. <laughs> so my office manager can do all that stuff. So when you hire associates, just to let you know, um, your dynamic changes and your role changes. And if you start to have several associates, um, it's going to be very challenging to be a full-time practitioner well, do it well, as well as you're doing it now, and have three-plus associates because – they're going to need some attention. They're going to need your love as well. They have become your customers, remember? So they're going to need your time and your, your attention. So just keep that in mind when you do that. And also keep in mind um, your setup. So my, I don't have people renting rooms. They're my employees. I have employees in my clinic, um, and they are part of the vision and mission of Acubound. So that's part of that right fit for associates. So what I'm talking here is not about people subsidizing your rent and just getting somebody in to rent rooms. Um, that's not something I'm interested in. I know a lot of people do that. I'm talking about ha- adding people to your team. You know, Google, they have lots of employees, but it started off with like one or two guys, right? And it grew. Um, these aren't um, programmers renting space at Google or at Apple, right? <laughs> or at Amazon. They started off with a few people with good ideas and then they kept on adding people to keep growing these ideas the vision and mission so that's what I'm talking about here I'm not talking about I got extra room so I'm just going to throw somebody in there and hopefully they subsidize my rent um, now with your associates what's really important is you need to train them well right and again I had to learn this uh, learn this the hard way you got to give your staff value and you got to treat them well and so Richard Branson here says, train people well enough so they can leave, treat them well enough so they don't want to. So that's some of the, I'm sharing with you the questions I get and some of the stuff I went through, like, geez, what happens if they leave you? Like, I don't want to give them all my secrets. You know, I used to hold back some of my referral network from my docs, right? Because I needed to be valuable and needed. Geez, if they meet all my referral networks and develop relationships with them, then they don't need me, right? And that was stressful for me. Um, I didn't want them to abandon me, so I held back. Again, I don't do that now. I give them everything I can. Um, and I learned right, up, right off the bat, train people well enough so they can leave. So they have access to healthy seminars. Again, the younger docs that I brought in, I mentor them. I make time to meet with them. Um, but I learned I got to treat them well enough so they don't want to. And so that's a key thing. And that's where you're developing that leadership and managerial skills. So I had to learn this. I didn't do this well at the beginning. Uh, I didn't treat them well enough so they would not want to leave. I I do now, I believe. I I definitely, that's my intention and my effort. Um, And then looking at uh, non-compete contracts. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to skip to this slide. This is more relevant. So somebody says, what happens if we invest in developing our people and they leave us? What happens? I love this question back. What happens if we don't and they stay, right? So would you rather have a poorly trained um, staff member. So what happens if we invest in people and they leave us? 
the answer is, well, what happens if you don't invest in your people and they're not trained properly and they actually work in your practice? That's a worst case scenario. It relates to this. So the non-competition agreement, to be honest, I don't know how well they hold up in court for medical practitioners, um, but you can put that in and I recommend you have it in. What we have done now for <laughs> investing in our, our staff so they, they want to stay is, um, again, transparency is one of the values at AccuBalance. So um, I invest in my staff um, and invest in their continued education. Um, as I mentioned um, in one of the interviews, um, they have access to healthy seminars that has free lectures and, and tons of uh, a CEU, PDA content. Sharon Weisenbaum has this incredible graduate mentorship program, and um, I invested in them. So that's not my program. I invested in them. But the way I did it, and, and, and in transparency, I said, look, I want to invest in you. I want you to be so sharp. I want you to be so knowledgeable. I want you to take such good care of my patients, our patients, and have great results. But I don't want to invest in you and pay up this large sum of money, and then in six months you leave. Jeez, I would be really resentful. So what I have done that's not so much a non-compete agreement, but what I've done is as follows, is I pay for my, my, my associates a lot of their things but they become employee loans that are forgivable. And you can choose the date, four years, three years. But the way I do it is I'm going to pay for this for you, and it's going to be a loan. And if you're in my clinic uh, four years from today, the loan is 100% forgivable. And I'm doing this because I don't want to pay for this, and you leave in one year. I would be resentful. And if you choose to leave in one year, I won't be resentful because you're going to have to pay every penny back. And so this is what I've done with my staff. And guess what? If somebody says, oh, I don't want to pay for that then. Well, you already know that somebody's got one foot out the door. <laughs> because all my docs are like, yeah, I don't care. I don't care. They don't, they don't have intention to leave. And if they leave, they'll pay me back. So they bought, their, they bought that investment in themselves. And if they stay, I'm investing. So that's what I've done with my docs. So people say, you know, if you want to pay their insurance, you want to pay their continued education, you want to pay whatever it is make it a loan. And it's, and again, it's, I don't depreciate. It's not like every year it goes down. No, you stay here three years, four years, you, you choose the date, how long you feel like they need to be around. Um, and then after that, it's forgivable. So that's what I've done. Um, I didn't come up with this idea. Um, a, a medical doctor colleague, um, I know does this people come in and, um, he trains them to do what he does. And he, and it's, he gives it a value of about $150,000. So he's training. So they're on the hook for this. So he'll train them and teach them everything. And if they leave before uh, five years was up, um, they have to pay it. Now he depreciates his, I think on, on a yearly basis, but again, you get the spirit of it is this way you, as the owner, you can freely give now because they're going to stay with you and you're going to reap the reward for them investing in themselves that you are funding. And if they leave before that time's up, they're paying you back. So they invested in themselves anyhow. So no resentment. Hopefully, Sam, you like that idea. You can, you can share that on your lectures. Tell them where you heard it, though, right? I, I only have a few good ideas. So it won't, it, nobody, when anybody gives credit for things I do, there's like two or three things. So never, it's, it's never a long list. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> um, so factors that lead to better performance and um, satisfaction. Um, I have four things I like. I found this on a, on a, in the Google image, so I just added the recognition at the bottom. But uh, Michael Pink, um, in his book, um, Drive, talks about for professionals to be satisfied so they want to stay where you can pay them fair market value. Actually, he, in his research, you can pay them 10% below fair market value and they'll stay. Money will never keep people long enough. Money, as you know, I'm sure you said, when I make $40,000, I'll be happy. You make $40,000. You know what? When I make ninety thousand dollars, then I'll, I'll be happy. Then you're making hundred. You know what? When I make hundred and fifty, it, it's just the mind is that desire. You'll never satisfy that. It's never. You'll never have enough, right? Because money only does so much. There's so many other things, intangibles that really cause satisfaction. There's research out there saying once you reach a certain threshold of income, I think seventy grand or seventy five, anything above that does not improve your happiness quotient. Um, why? Because this is what they show um, people need to feel satisfied in a position. They need autonomy, right? So if you're being micromanaged, you're not going to like it. But if you feel like you have some autonomy, meaning you have some control, then it's more fun. 
So my associates, they have autonomy. It's not a free for all. We all have the same business card. There's certain things we study and there's certain things that you can do and cannot do in our clinic, right? So there's boundaries, but there's some good autonomy. I mean, we have this in life too, right? You can't just go out and um, walk naked, go and take your neighbor's belongings. You know, there's boundaries here. You have autonomy as an individual, but there's things you can and cannot do. So same thing in your practice. You're going to have some structure, some boundaries. Um, the more tightly controlled it is, the less um, enjoyable it's going to be for your associates, for your staff. And the more there's some autonomy, flexibility, um, the better. Mastery. Well, guess what? Chinese medicine, you will not, you can't live long enough. You, 120 years is not enough to master Chinese medicine. So it's one of those things. You've got the rest of your life to master this medicine. So congratulations. Mastery of skill you'll always have an opportunity to grow in this profession. Wonderful. And then purpose. You got to feel like you're, you're creating value, right? So these are the three main things people need to have. They need to feel like they have value, they have impact, there's some importance um, to what they're doing, purpose. We know now some of the research is showing that health issues can result from not having um, purpose in life. So having purpose, a reason to get up every morning, um, is going to affect your, your well-being and your health. And so same thing in your job, your associates have to feel like there's a sense of purpose. The fourth thing that's really important is recognition. This is one of the things I did terrible at. So I'm a self-starter. Um, you know, when I became a CPA, I didn't throw a party. When I graduated from Chinese medicine school, all my buddies used their student loans and went on a huge trip and took two weeks off. The very next day on Monday, I opened up my practice. Um, when I got my doctorate of Chinese medicine, because I started off as a licensed acupuncturist and then I, I did other boards and got my doctor, I didn't celebrate. I do now. I know how to celebrate now, but I never knew how to celebrate. So I never gave myself that personal recognition. So I never gave it to anybody else in my, in my practice. I just thought people just work hard and I'm a self-starter. I'm, I'm self-motivated. So I just did work. And, um, and so I burnt out my admin staff and my associates early on because they did amazing things. They are incredible, the ones I have now and the ones I had in the past. But I never let them know. And it doesn't have to be like a big present. You just have to acknowledge them that I really appreciate what you're doing today. A pat on the back, um, you know, buy them a smoothie. Um, and every once in a while, a nice gift or a present's nice as well. But just letting them know you care and really letting them know you care is important, right? And so I did this terribly. And if you don't give recognition to your people, or even if you do, if they don't feel they're being recognized, if they don't feel they're being recognized enough, they can't be happy there. So that's part of that right fit too. Some people are, are, are wounded inside, right? And uh, they just have this belief, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough. And so no matter what you say to them, they can't even hear it anyhow. So you got to look at who you hire as well and where their wounds are because some people you can give them all the recognition in the world and they won't even see it because of the lens they wear and they'll miss it. And you know, you attract who you are as well. So um, if you have somebody in your practice like that, again, turn the fingers inward. Where are you not recognizing yourself? Where are you, um, where are you wounded? Because really everybody's just a beautiful mirror uh, to us. Renumeration. I'm not going to go into detail because we don't have the time and, you know, so it's outside the scope of this, but I will share that there's different styles of doing this. Um, you can do salary. You can do commission. Again, pay rent to me is not a, a, a vision growth. It's, it's just paying rent. It's just find somebody to pay. It doesn't mean you're going to have the right fit. Um, really, if you're going to go through the effort of having the right fit, I would make them part of your team. Um, Salary at the beginning can be risky because you're paying them and they may not have patients to treat, so they may not be bringing in revenue. But if you have a busy practice and you're able to fill their practice, then you as the owner, it can really um, add um, a value, financial value to your practice. Commission takes the risk away because if they don't have any patients that month, you don't have to pay them anything. Um, but if depending on how you set it up, if they're super busy and you're referring lots to them, then um, they make a ton and it's hard for you to expand or scale your business or several clinics if, if there's a big percentage of, your, of the revenue coming in is going to them. And, you know, there's a cultural, cultural idea in our, in our medicine um, about this split 60 40, for the, 60 for the practitioner, 40 for the owner. It's, it's kind of crazy. You don't really see that in other industries normally. Um, and to scale a practice or open up other practices where 60% of the revenues coming in is going to that individual, you can't, you can't scale. 
Um, they need to be paid fairly. So I will say when you do commission, when I set up my, my commission, you got to look at what you charge um, your patients. How many rooms does your doctor have? So my, my docs have two rooms, sometimes three rooms. So whatever your percentage is, it's really, you got to look at if they were 80% full based on the sh uh, schedule they would work, how much do they make? And is that fair? So you can say you pay your, you give 30% to your commissions, to your, your associates and people go 30%. Oh my God. But 30% of what? Like, would you rather a hundred percent of a thousand or 30% of 10 million? 30% of 10 million. So don't worry about what the percentage is. Really figure out. So I always work backwards. How many rooms do they have? How much are we charging? If they're 100% full, what does that bring in? And what, and what would I want to pay my associate? What's a fair remuneration for them to be doing this job? You know, when you think of Google, um, some programmers do great things at Google, but does it? Google's worth millions and the programmers are making good pay but I'm sure they're not making 40% of the remuneration of the revenue that comes into Google, right? So I look at it as what do I want to pay them? And I have some docs on, on salary and I have some docs on commission. It's all going to be, come down to what's the value. So why do people choose AccuBound? Some of the reasons, because I've asked them, um, they like the, uh, the continued education that we take care of for them, right? We have healthy seminars. So all the pro D courses, they have access to that. They get to go to the integrated fertility symposium. We're connected with the really cool fertility hospital here. Um, so the things that they get to do is, is pretty great. And we're a busy practice. So, they, you know, like they come out of practice and they're seeing patients every day when they treat. You know, they're not having to pound the pavement for patients. So the value I bring to, to docs is they come in and they get mentorship. They get to continually learn. And they have patients. So they're looking for patients, but we're giving them patients. Um, so you got to see the value. If somebody wants to join your practice and you're not busy and they're going to show up and they have to find all their patients all on their own, then your setup will be very different than my setup. So what is the value that you're bringing to your associates? Not just what the value is for your associates for you, but you always got to think, what value am I bringing to them? And then you got to put a price on that and decide if it's fair. And if you can give people mentorship, you can give them continued education and you can give them um, patience to fill their practice. I'm sure that's quite valuable to a lot of practitioners. So it comes down to math, the number of rooms available to them. If it's one room available to them, that your percentage would be different than if they have four rooms available to them uh, on a shift and how many days they, a week they work, et cetera. So in closing, there is no I in team, right? And so together, everyone achieves more. So you really want to hire for cultural fit. It's, it's, it's the key. Um, go back to healthyseminars.com forward slash right fit. And there you will find um, um, the process that I do for hiring and men's staff. And then just some other resources. Um, um, I wrote the book for you guys, uh, Missing the Point, Why Acupuncturists Fail and What They Need to Know to Succeed. So you can go to missingthepointbook.com. Um, healthy seminars is where you have free one hour lectures and then um, also paid CEU PDA lectures are all online. And then the integrated fertility symposium. These are some of my babies that I have. And then as well, my AccuBalance uh, clinic um, that is a big baby of mine that I love that I started back in 2000. So that's all I have to say, Sam. Um, hopefully the listeners um, like that, some of the resources I share here, are, these are the books I recommend you all should be reading if you're a practitioner. The Practitioner's Path to Success by Dan Clements, The Compound Effect by Darren Harding, um, and Missing the Point by me. I think that should be in your library, and I could give you 100 more books, but start with those three. Um, Sam, if you have a book out, we'll add that to, your, to our list because Sam and I have chatted. He knows his stuff, so he'll help you find that success. And then HealthySeminars.com has some good resources as well. Dr. Lauren, this has been great. I think maybe the most practical, I think each of these prior lectures are very good, but I think this was probably the most practical. And I think um, this is something that most offices and doctors really need to understand and learn because this is the business side. Now, one takeaway I took is you're building a culture and a team. Now, I'm in Orange County. And the one thing I think is interesting, the company Disney does not have employees. Everybody's a cast member. 
And that little bit of statement just makes people feel differently about where they're at. And I think that's that's a big factor, that I think, that you brought up as well. And you'll notice success breeds the same way. The other thing I'll bring up, of course, we've got an audience here in the United States. Now, when you start talking commission and other things, I want to remind everyone, be very careful and understand the tax implications and fee splitting. So we got to be careful on the commission side, on how that's being set up for taxes. So please talk to a tax attorney or an accountant to make sure you're doing this in the right way so that you're not just splitting fees and the person's paying a fair amount. But I do think you want to definitely understand that team member aspect. If someone is just paying rent, that's it, they're paying rent. But if they're working as a team, but as a team now, you're an employer, is there tax implications? I can't think enough. This has been, uh, I think, the most practical. And I just want to remind everyone, take a look at those books. We have our stuff online. Get to seminars, get out and learn, do more, and make yourself invaluable in the sense that understand all those aspects of the business end of it so that you can take care of your patients and hire the right people. So, Dr. Lauren, I'm going to thank you. I think this has been great. I want to have you back. I think there's some more topics we can bridge over. So I'm looking forward to that. But I can't thank you enough. And for everyone, American Acupuncture Council, that's AACinfo, I-N-F-O, network.com. We hope to see you soon.